and welcome to the Rating Room Podcast. It's Jay and Andy again. Uh, we're recording another special episode today and we have a guest with us. Uh, please welcome Toby. Toby, why don't you tell us and the listeners a little bit about yourself? Hi guys, uh, happy to be here. Uh, my name's Toby. I've been a Bond fan since I was a wee boy. And, uh, well, I'm actually a film fan, you know, the sort of person who gets total film delivered and and that sort of thing up until recently bond has been sort of like my go-to thing ever since uh films were a thing back in the days when you would tape things off the telly and, and re-watch them on vhs and go to the video shop and, and and hire films out and that sort of thing i was the first person in in my circle of friends to get dvd players and, and that sort of thing so films and memorabilia and things like that i collect as well so film is a big part of my life and uh so you know to be on something like this is is perfect for me total film over empire magazine then well, it started Total Film because I got it free for six months when I opened a bank account when I was about 23, 24. And I sort of, once I'd sort of got into it, then, then that was the one I, I went with. I did have Empire for a while. It was around the time of Pirates of the Caribbean coming out. Uh, and I can't remember why I switched, but I did. But I think at some point I switched back and then I, I gave up altogether. Let's continue with the theme of the James Bond. First question, Toby. What is your earliest Bond memory? I remember that... We do remember when you were kids. I mean, you guys are probably just about old enough. You'd get the, the TV guide and you'd get a marker pen and you'd circle everything you wanted to watch at Christmas. And my dad was looking at what I put on and I remember I'd circled, I think it was Condor Man and, you know, a few other things. And he said, oh, you haven't put James Bond down. And I was like, well, it's the spy who loved me. I mean, really, do I really want to see the film about love and stuff when I'm eight seven whatever it was and he said no 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 you'll you'll really enjoy this one you'll really enjoy this one so i reluctantly put a circle around it going into the the viewing thought that it was some sort of soppy love film rather than what actually the spy who loved me really is and i do recall i can't remember it's christmas day or boxing day and i just remember sitting there and from about halfway through until it finished, almost in tears because I hadn't recorded it. And I was just mesmerized by it. And uh, I think uh, as, a, as a first Bond for a, a child who was born in the mid-70s and grew up in the 80s, it was just so different. You know, it was like the A-team on steroids, for want of a better word. So was your dad a, a big Bond fan? I wouldn't say he was a big Bond fan. He he was he was one of these people who felt that once you'd seen a film once, you should never revisit it because he always thought that you get your best impression the first time and there should be no reason to ever go and watch a film again. And I think that's probably a mantra he's kept all his life because occasionally he has, you know, he's in his late 70s now he said to me oh, i started watching a film the other day and halfway through I realized I'd already seen it, which was a complete waste of time. Um whereas you know, I'm somebody who will quite happily watch the same film many, many times. Yeah, I've my wife's like that. When more about TV series, she won't rewatch series if she's watched them more than you know, she's seen them once. We don't revisit them. And there's so many good series out there that I'd want to watch. But let's get back on on track here. So, what would you say your favourite Bond film is? It's a difficult one, and and it's one of those ones where I think if you ask me today, and then you asked me in six months time it, it could change i think though i generally always come back to the living daylights but at the same time i've got the softest spot ever for live and let die and for casino royale film as well but i think generally i always come back to the living daylights i think it was the first film that i saw in the cinema um, the first Bond film or non-animated film I saw in the cinema as a kid. But my, oh, and I was talking to my dad about this the other day. He thinks that it was a view to a kill, but if it was, I don't remember it. But yeah, I mean, The Living Daylights is, is a great Bond and um, it's a shame we didn't see more Dalton films. Okay, so you just talked about your, your favourite Bond film. So what about your worst Bond film? That one's easy for me. It's You Only Live Twice. I can't give you a single reason that I dislike it, but I do know that it's, it's the one that, if it was coming on the TV and there was a Bond film just showing on ITV tomorrow, there's a chance I might watch it. But if it was that one, I probably wouldn't. There are so many things that, that I dislike about it. I think that as well, because I, when I watched the Bond films growing up, I watched them in the order that the BBC and the ITV put them out rather than the order in which they were presented. So for me, I was always against little things like the fact that Blofeld 
from a later film is playing a, a sub character in You Only Live Twice and the stupid sort of whole thing where he is uh, turning into a Japanese person and, and that sort of thing. I mean, uh, I remember enjoying the, the little Nelly flights and, and that sort of air battle and stuff, but I didn't even have a great affiliation for the big sort of ninja battle at the end because I was, was frustrated by the fact that he went through all this ninja training and they just used guns the whole time. So it, it seemed a bit of a waste of time. He would have been better off on the shooting range than, than doing all this ninja training. But as, as a film, it's just one that I, I've never... I've never really felt any affiliation to. And it's it's always the one that if you ask me, it, it, there's no question. It's, it's always that one. Yeah, that's um, it's a good shout, actually. We've talked about it on, a, on an earlier pod and particularly the, the part where it turns Japanese. It doesn't age well at all. Yeah, one, one of our lower rated ones so far, has to be said. Uh, but yeah, you've talked about three different films there and three different actors actually involved with those. So uh, we, you talked a little bit about a Moore film, a, a Dalton film, a Connery film, but... Who would you say is your favourite Bond actor of them all? I think my favourite, as opposed to the, what I think is the best Bond actor, my favourite is Roger Moore. And I think that's just because he was the man that was Bond for me for probably the first, certainly three, possibly four Bond films I ever saw. They were all Roger Moore. You know, if, if I close my eyes and somebody says to you, what does Bond look like? He looks like Roger Moore. I, I think that... It, it hit me so it hit me between the eyes when I was a kid and, and I don't think you can shake that although if you said to me who do I think was the best Bond actor I would probably put Daniel Craig in there even though no matter how much I try to like it I cannot enjoy the final film but I think his Bondness in Casino Royale is nobody's done it better to quote themselves um, but yeah I think Roger Moore is my favourite Bond uh, I, I liked his his casual way of being you know the gentleman spy suave and sophisticated but could take a punch you, you mentioned briefly there No Time to Die Toby would you say that's that's quite close to your worst Bond film or is You Only Live Twice out there? Having never sort of decided to really put every Bond film in a ranked order on a piece of paper, I couldn't tell you exactly, but it would be near the bottom for sure. Um, it would certainly be towards the bottom. And th there's, a, there's a myriad of reasons. And I, th I think it's one of those things where when... It may be if I'd watched it when I was... If I was a 12-year-old having seen it for the first time, as opposed to being a... A, a man in his 40s watching it for the first time then the answer might be very different but for me i, I just I, I struggle with it I, I think that the 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 whole MacGuffin that's built that it's built around is what i struggle with you, you know you've mentioned your favorite film your worst film your favorite bond actor do you have a favorite theme song from the bond series <laughs> funnily enough casino royale um which doesn't even i don't think mention the name of the film in the in the song you know my name chris Cornell. It's one of the few Bond songs that I could listen to uh, a lot and not necessarily associate with Bond. I just think it's a, it, it's a great song on its own. I also enjoy, like, I think what most people's favourites are, things like Live and Let Die, The Living Daylights. But I, there's not really a Bond film song that I've all, or a theme song that I've, I've enjoyed. When I was a kid, I would reach for the remote as soon as the music started and I would be able to practically have it down to the millisecond when I push play again, knowing when to, to, to skip the, the theme song because, you know, I, I didn't even enjoy it. And I think there was a couple of ones which I'd taped off the television and I actually paused the recording while the song was on and then push play record again when the song was finished so that that way I didn't have to worry about listening to it through later because I always felt that it was a bit of a waste of time. And I think as well, back then, having a pre-credit was very unique to Bond. I don't think it was something that anybody else was really doing at the time. So for me, it always felt a bit out of sync. It's like, do the song, then do the film and then finish. But this, this put it out of order. As a kid, the song was just, it wasn't for me. And I think, I mean, I was watching uh, a Bond film the other day with, with my, with my eldest daughter, who's 19. And, uh, as we were watching, she had the remote in her hand. She fast forwarded it. And I was like, yeah, I'm all for that. I'm all for that. <laughs> so it may, maybe it's a family trait that we're, we're not, we're, I'm not a big music person anyway, but you know, my name by Chris Cornell. I, I, I can listen to that song over. It's, it's, it's a good song. Yeah. Thanks for that. That's a fascinating insight into the music. Another big component of the Bond series are the Bond girls. Now of the, the many to choose from, 
Do you have a favourite or favourites? I guess it, it depends on what your term of, of, of favourite is. <laughs> I think the one that uh, I think was, was the best played in which... Um, I'm pretty sure you guys poo-pooed actually was was Andrew Anders from uh, The Man with the Golden Gun. But if you ask me which one did I have the biggest crush on, then that would probably be uh, Pam Bouvier from Licence to Kill. Probably uh, two ends of, of the spectrum there. Toby, what's your favourite villain? So this could be uh, the main villain or one of the henchmen. Do you have a particular favourite or favourites? The best henchman is always Jaws. He, he defines what every Bond villain was from that point, I think early on, Odd Job set the uh, set the bar very high, and then until Jaws came along, nobody came close to that. But I think Jaws took Odd Job's mantle, and even to this day, I don't think anyone's come close to it in Bond films. Maybe excluding you know one or two like Goldeneye. The villain isn't that sort of intimidating, or you know, isn't somebody that Bond would fear physically in any shape or form. But the the henchmen, they're the ones that. You know, they're the ones that Bond has got to worry about. They're the ones that, if he's going to get beating, it's going to come from a henchman, generally. But the, the, the other one that, that I love, I think, because I think it's the comedic effect and, and where it falls in the film it is, is Dr. Kaufman from Tomorrow Never Dies, where the, the main villain has Stamper, who is his muscle. Uh, he has his... Uh, more interesting sort of side henchman, Dr. Kaufman, who's telling Bond that he could shoot him from Munich and still make it look like suicide. You know, he, he's a he's a lovable character. I think it helps he's got that sort of quirky look about him and, the, you know, the, the silly accent and everything. He's almost a, a caricature of whoever it is he's trying to be. But it's a great scene. It's, it's one of my favourite Bond scenes, in fact, is in the whole franchise, is is the bit between uh, Kaufman and and, uh, and Bond. And, uh, you know, the little bits that you that come along later when, you know, Stamper tells him that he was like, a, Kaufman was his idol, or I can't remember what the word is he uses. They're the two that jump out at me most. Do you know Jaws has appeared in two films? Do you have a particular favourite, or do you like Jaws in both of the films? Uh, I like him in both. I think, I mean, I re met Richard Keel once. He was doing a, a, a UK tour and uh, it would have been about, let me think, I would have been about 21, 22 at the time or maybe a bit older. So we're probably looking at sort of 2000 there or thereabouts. And I was, I was working as a hotelier at the time and, and he was staying in our hotel so it's it's one of those things as a hotelier you know if celebs come along you you treat them no differently than you would anybody else and you you know you don't go around asking for photographs and signatures and, and that sort of thing because it's not the done thing i still regret to this day that i followed company protocol and uh apart from having a little chat with him and he was the nicest chap because uh he came i was the duty manager and he'd had a problem with his shower not working and i, when I was talking to him he was uh he was very much you know Oh, do you know? Don't worry. These things will happen. You know, don't worry. If you can just get it fixed for me, I, I'd really appreciate it. And if you can't, if you could just let me know, and and then at least I won't waste time trying to take a shower if it's not going to work. Uh, really, really lovely chap. He showed me his his teeth because he kept he kept them in his pocket, but he uh, he didn't he didn't put them in. Uh, it was also a little bit of a, a a letdown in some respects because by 2000 he was quite old and frail. He had a stick. Uh, you could tell it was him. But he, he was hunched over a little bit. You know, he wasn't that big, intimidating man from uh, from the screen. But, you know, even to the to this day. But to, to answer your question, uh, yes, he's definitely a better villain in uh, The Spy Who Loved Me than he is in, in Moonraker. But I quite like the fact that, you know, they, they bowed to peer pressure and, and turned him into a goodie at the end. Spoiler alert for anybody who hasn't seen it. <laughs> But I think the spoiler alert, um, you know, at uh, what is it? Must be what, coming up for 50 years or more. <laughs> it's probably about 50 years since that film came out. So um, I think all bets are off at this point. That's a great story. I actually met Richard Keel myself probably a similar time frame to you. Uh, we talked about it on the main pod briefly, but yeah, around sort of early 2000s. And he was doing a signing in my hometown. It was kind of like a, they, had a, they used to call it the Mardi Gras, but it was just a big big like festival type thing and he was with a, a very pushy assistant who was trying to shoo people away as quickly as possible which was a bit of a shame but he was uh it's the first time i've ever been properly starstruck 
um, because you know of the the Bond connection. But yeah, he was uh, like you said, he was not not the peak of physical health, but still a, a towering giant of a man. And you know, people kept their distance if they didn't want to meet him. That's for sure. So it was uh, still enough of a, a bit of a presence. Um, yeah, it's a, a good a good story to hear from you. Um, so you mentioned about. Uh, a scene earlier with uh, with Dr. Kaufman, uh, which kind of brings me on to my next question, which was around memorable scenes. What what are the scenes that kind of stand out to you for, you know, good or bad reasons um, throughout the franchise? It's got to be all the chases. There are so many great chases. Everything is so... The, the boat chase in, in Live and Let Die, the car chase in the garage in tomorrow never dies where he's got the bmw 7 series the aston chase uh out on the out on the ice which even though is a bit crazy and you know it, the villain actually had something that was comparable to bond in that you know he had a, a gadget filled vehicle as well the the living daylights the uh, aston chase in that one as well i think that's probably the one that that sticks in my mind the most, you know, where he cuts the larder in half, the larder police car slams on his brakes and the car separates, you know, as a, a I'm guessing that film probably came out in the late eighties, um, mid to late eighties. I think I was probably 10 or 12 when I saw it. And I just remember being, seeing that in the cinema and I was just, this is amazing. This is the greatest thing I've ever seen ever. And, and the chase, it's quite a long one and there's a few comedic things and I'm rewatching it recently. There's a few cringy moments in it, but you know, you don't spot that as a kid and, and it's, it's a, it's a great scene. The chases, especially car chases and, and things like that. They always stick in my mind watching the man with the golden gun the other day and him and Sheriff J W Pepper chasing um, the man with the golden gun through uh, the streets of i think it's thailand isn't it and um it, it's an amazing scene it, it's uh if you uh, and i think as well as somebody who's grown a bit older and, and you see so many films now with all these special effects and green screen and digitization and stuff when you watch these films you can say there was a guy doing this he was behind the wheel and everything you see they did you know can you imagine them doing that corkscrew jump today? They'd do it with CGI, wouldn't they? They would never they'd never take the time to actually get a stuntman and say, right, we're going to do this. And I think you've already mentioned that, you know, they, they saw this stunt and they bought it long before they used it. But, you know, there are things like that that are just... If somebody has put on YouTube every Bond chase end-to-end, -end, I'd probably just have that on my YouTube <laughs> channel constantly on repeat because, it, you know, it, even though I'm in my, you know, like I said earlier, <laughs> I'm in my mid-40s, it's it's something I can just go back and watch over and over and over. Um, you know, it never gets boring for me. There are a few other things, I thought, well, in terms of scenes that stick in my mind. Like the earliest one I remember is the, the battle inside Strongberg's tanker. It's probably only a couple of minutes long. I remember when I watched it, having not seen it for 20 years, and again, this was going back 15 years ago, when they first came out on DVD. And I remember thinking to myself when I watched it, oh, I thought it was a lot longer than that, the, the, the fight in Strongberg's tanker, but clearly it wasn't. Um, you know, it's a few minutes, but it's, it's nonstop. That's some really um, good highlights there in terms of the Bond franchise, Toby. Just before I move on to my next question, in terms of, you've obviously mentioned the corkscrew jump, what did you think about the sound effect? It's a difficult one. It's all I've ever known, and I have no problem with it. And I think that it doesn't help as well, because I've seen the, the extras off the, the DVD, and um, Roger and Cubby Broccoli were talking about it, and they were saying how... When they did it, the whole cast and crew that were out went down to watch it. And uh, after he'd done the stunt, Cubby was like, it was too perfect. Do you mind doing it again? And the guy was like, I'm off. <laughs> There's no way I'm doing that again. <laughs> we got lucky the first time. <laughs> There's no way I'm going to do it again. And when they were when they were like playing it back, the, the original plan was to play Bond's theme over the top of it. But it just didn't play. And then they tried it with no sound, and then it's just weird. And so had J.W. Pepper not been in the car, I think you're right in terms of it 
potentially being something people would complain about. But with Sheriff J.W. Pepper in the car, he is the comedy effect. He is the light-hearted part of it. And him being in there and then, you know, one of possibly Bond's greatest ever lines when he's asked if, you know, and he says, oh, I've never done that before. And well, neither have I, actually. It, it, it all comes together. So, yeah, I... I would be sad if there was a version of it where they took it out. That's brilliant. That's an interesting way, yeah, because we obviously the sound effect's something we've spoken about on the pod, and when you put it into that context, it does shed a different light on it. So, uh... Uh, especially with, I mean, you having probably watched all the films quite close together, you've probably noticed how it's like they had a very limited stock of sound effects in the Bond library and that they reuse them over and over and over. You know, the, the twisting metal of something breaking and, uh, uh, and sound effects from computers and, and things like that have been reused over and over all the way through the Bond films um, between sort of Sean's middle films and all of Roger's films that... Uh, you know, as somebody who watched a lot of Bond, you'd say, well, that's in that film and that's in that film and that sound effect is in that film. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I quite like that the, 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 the whistle is used in that, in that jump. That's great, Toby. So moving on, do you have a particular favourite gadget in the franchise? Because in our main series, we, we kind of highlight the gadgets that Bond uses. I wonder, do you have a particular favourite in the franchise? Individual gadgets... Uh, and, and the cars are the two things I, I, I separate when I think about gadgets because, you know, do you count the cars as one gadget or individual gadgets within the cars? So I, I think it's easier because of the number of things you have, especially in the, the V8 Vantage and the, the, the Lotus Esprit particularly, and, and, and I guess the Vanish as well, that they've, they've got so many gizmos built into them that, you know, you, you have to count them as, as a single entity. But, so the cars, they're all my favourite. You know, all the cars, from the DB5, uh, the, the Lotus, the Aston Martins, you know, it, they're all my favourite. But individual gadgets, things that Q gives him that, aren't cars i've got probably the 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 wrist dark gun that is used in in moonraker um i think it's one of those ones which is you could see it being used in real world back then and if somebody somebody somewhere's probably invented it you can somebody on the internet's probably got one for sale um but it's one of those ones that of all the gadgets he got given it was one that you thought a, it's really useful for someone like him, but also it's really believable. It's something you think, yeah, I can go with that. There, there are quite a few gadgets in there that you think, well, that's a bit naff. I, I remember when I saw Goldeneye for the first time and he's got his watch, which has got this incredibly powerful laser. Um, I don't know what battery he's got in that watch, but um, it's probably better than the one in my iPhone because it's over over powerful in my eyes, which uh, is one of the, and I'm also one of these people that's like, you know, don't tear a Bond film to shreds. It's entertainment. If there's a gaff or a, you know, you see a, re like when people see the reflection of the, the crew in um, the man with the golden gun when he's fighting with the belly dancer and well, not fighting her but in her room um you know i just say oh stuff all that stuff you know it doesn't make the film any less enjoyable um you know occasionally every film and show has a bit of in, you know continuity errors and stuff and with the internet and um there's even a website called movie mistakes that my wife was obsessed with with for a while and i, I can't be dealing with all that so you know going back to the the gadgets i think that the 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 dark gun from moonraker is is the one that it always frustrated me why did he have it in moonraker and then not use it again in the rest of his entire career surely it was such a useful gadget he should still have it now yeah that is a good point it, it's very rare that he actually reuses gadgets it's usually a completely new set in each film other than maybe some different spec watches so uh, that's, uh, that's a good way a uh, good way of thinking about it so you, you talk about I mean, we we have a, a little talk about goose and continuity errors on the pod but you're right in terms of letting it spoil your enjoyment of the film like the the nitpicking is too much we we like to take a light-hearted view at a handful but when movie mistakes says there's 75 mistakes in this film and it's you know getting down to the minutia it does it does kind of take you out of the moment um but let's let's switch gears slightly so 
the franchise has been you know, 60 years plus in the making now. There's been lots of highs and lows. Uh, what would you say would, is the low point of the franchise? When you sent me the uh, the form uh, to fill in on this one, I I think I wrote the Japanese the Japaneseification in You Only Live Twice. <laughs> I don't know if that's even a word. You know where they make Bond Japanese. I would also say that the that the nanobots from the most recent film uh, comes in maybe at the uh, the same level, maybe even worse. They're, I mean, You Only Live Twice is a film that I, I'm not, as I've already said, I'm not a big fan of. And that is that is possibly the lowest point for me uh, in there. When I was talking about this with, with my wife and she said, do, do you not look back at all these Bond films and think now that, you know, Roger Moore was a misogynist <laughs> and, uh, and I'm like, well, Bond has always been of his time. You know, if you look at Bond from the books and you look at Bond from... The, the films at, from the first to the most recent, he's always of his time. He is, what he does is deemed acceptable in the, the, the time zone that the films are made in and that they live in. And because they are of their time, it's one of the things I think that makes them timeless and that makes them always feel like they are, they are right. There's, it's not like, uh, somebody was talking on a forum I'm on recently about, they think it would be a good idea if, when Bond is reintroduced that they reintroduce him back in the 60s or something like that. And, and my argument to that is Bond is always of his time. Every Bond has always been in the real world in the time that he lived with the, the world problems existing around him which are current at that time. Like the energy crisis that's that's talked about with the Solex in The Man with the Golden Gun. You know, at the time there was an oil crisis going on and it it was a real valid sort of problem in the world. And, that you know, these are the things that make Bond of his time. So at the time when You Only Live Twice came out, I'm not sure what critics said about James Bond going Japanese, whether it was even mentioned by critics to say, well, this is a bit close to the edge. But when you look back at it in, you know, the woke world that we're living in today, you know, if the, if somebody released that film with that exact thing today, it, it probably wouldn't even get past the censors. So, yeah, you, you can't really compare. But that and the fact that um, the nanobots, I think, was a technology too far um, in the most recent film. They're the two lows for me. We we talk about one-liners and quotes in our main episodes. Do you have any particular favourite one-liners or quotes in the franchise? Yes. It's got to be The Spy Who Loved Me when he's being chased by the motorbike with the uh, sidecar torpedo. Bond makes it around the lorry. The uh, I think it even says on the side of the lorry, mattress company or, or, or something like that. It explodes Feathers go everywhere, bike drives through feathers, and as he goes off the cliff, Bond casually says all those feathers and he still can't fly. To which Triple X just gives him a sort of, did you just say that kind of look? <laughs> um, I'm not sure whether the look was meant to be, yeah, that was that was good that you killed him, or whether that was, that sounds a bit harsh, <laughs> seeing as how you just sent a man to his death. But uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it's a great line. It, even today when I see it, it makes me smile. Just before we move on, Toby, you obviously mentioned earlier on that Roger Moore is your, your favourite Bond. In terms of delivering kind of like the one-liners that Bond delivers, do you think Moore is the, the better Bond or do you think all the actors that have portrayed Bond have delivered one-liners spot on or is there any ones that you think, oh, that, if only Roger Moore delivered that line instead of, say, Sean Connery or Timothy Dalton? I think, I mean, Dalton had so few I think he tried to, um, you know, separate himself from that. But yeah, Connery set the bar early on. I'm not sure what his first one was. I'm probably guessing it's shocking after he uh, electrocutes the guy in the bathtub. Um, but there, there could be others before that. But that's the one that, that comes to mind. So everything that happened after that, it was he'd set a precedent and and bond from that point on he he had he had to go along go along with it and 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 come up with them and I, and like i said bonds are of their time so it's important that each one 
delivered the lines which were right for them and that came out for them. So I, I wouldn't want to see another Bond delivering a different Bond's line. I, I don't think it would work. Yeah, I, I tend to agree. And I I think Roger Moore had a, a smoothness to the way he, to his delivery. Con- Connery and Moore, for me, are the two that stand out as the real the real one-liner kings. Let's switch gears again just slightly. So one of the features we have on the main pod is the difference between movies and books. Uh, so my question is, have you read any of the Bond books, either the originals by Ian Fleming or the more recent ones by new authors? I, I, I have an Audible account and I, I went through all the Bond books uh, on Audible a few years ago. And I really don't remember much about them. Uh, I do remember thinking, oh, Moonraker, that's the plot for Goldeneye. And a few other sort of things that, that I picked up on them. And uh, there's the, the only one I haven't read fully because I returned it was The Spy Who Loved Me because it, it was just horrible. But because it's written from a female's point of view, the person they had reading the book was was reading it like they were reading some kind of Fifty Shades of Grey or similar, and she was talking like this the whole way through, uh, and it became it became I, I just couldn't be dealing with it. So uh, I've never returned many books to Audible, but that that one went straight back after fifteen minutes of of you know biting through and stopping it, le- reading a couple of reviews and then thinking, that's yeah, not for me. I've also read some of uh, some of the newer books. I can't remember the authors, but I-, I had a look back at my Audible and there was one called Carte Blanche and another one called Never Dream of Dying. I think there was a third one, but I've got 300 and something books on my Audible account, so I, I can't, I didn't have the uh, energy to go and-, and-, and check back on all of them. Uh, the one thing that I do recall is is the language used in Fleming's books. You know, he wasn't frightened of, you know, the N-word. And he wasn't, he was clearly somebody who would be cancelled in today's culture um, and cancelled hard. He was writing these books back when it was pretty much acceptable to, to use that kind of language. Uh, I read somewhere not that long ago about somebody trying to rewrite the books, but changing the language so that they were acceptable in today's society uh, and having done Dr. No, uh, he gave up because he just said it doesn't work, you know, the the story it loses its its direction, it loses what it stands for and he, he decided to, to give it up after one book. Toby, at the time of recording this episode with you they haven't announced the new Bond yet. Who do you think should be the next Bond? And do you have anyone in mind? And also, thinking back, were you happy with the Daniel Craig casting? I think that I've always been one of these people who, has, with, with, with any film, be it Bond or anything, where there's an expectation because something already exists in that universe, to be, let me see, you show me what you can do, and then I'll make a decision. You know, had Craig been awful, you know, what we're about to say would be very different. But I think as a performance, it was probably the best. Casino Royale, his first film, is probably the best Bond performance by any Bond actor in any Bond film at any time. You know, people will probably argue long and hard with me that I'm completely wrong. But I expect there's going to be an awful lot of people who will agree with me at the same time. I think he was so lucky to be given that opportunity to start Bond again from the very beginning. So he's not even a double O at the beginning. Had any other actor had that opportunity, I hope they would have given it as uh, and put as much into it uh, as, as he did. But it gave him the opportunity to own that role. Uh, and his performance in Casino Royale is, is flawless, in, in my opinion. It is, it's perfect. And who do you reckon should be the next Bond actor? Yeah, I was putting that off because I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I would prefer it if it was somebody who is not been a primary actor in a big budget film already. I think that if it, and I would also, because, you know, TV series are now so big, they're probably as big as or bigger than, than film in terms of, you know, how visible an actor is. I'd like to see them pick somebody who is, and, and people can disagree with me on this one, I think it should be a white male aged 35 to 40 who is in good physical condition, 
who is a bit of eye candy, but also looks like he can handle himself in a scrap. That's all I really care about. Yeah, um, I disagree with people who say, oh, the next Bond should be a woman or the next Bond should be black or, you know, all these sort of variations because Bond is a character who we know and we know roughly who he is. You know, all the people who've played Bond uh, have been relatively similar they the way they portrayed the well, well whether they were, whether they're like that in other films or in in other areas maybe they're different but in terms of how they portray bond has always been similar they've all had their own way of doing it but they've all been similar and i think they all all of them would fit into that list of requirements that i just put out whether the people who are making the film have the same list of requirements that i do or not We'll never know until we see who's who's actually named. And, you know, the internet being the internet, there's people being thrown out there on a regular basis. And there's a few who I look at and I go, well, I think they're too high profile and they're too old and, and, and things like that. And I think looking back at the last couple, we've I think it's always been a bit of a surprise. And especially with Daniel Craig, it was a bit of a surprise to people. I remember at the time, and you have to forgive me, the actor's name escapes me. He was in a film called Croupier, um, and he was a villain in the Bourne film. It'll come to me. But I remember him being the, the, the favourite uh, at the time. And, you know, it surprised everybody when it wasn't him. I feel like I should do a Google search because it's going to frustrate. I've just done that on your behalf because uh, I had the same thought. It's Clive Owen you're thinking of. And I completely agree. He he was, I, I remember him being my favourite at the time, I think, or certainly the one I expected to get the role. Clive Owen, that's right. Clive Owen, was. I think he was he was almost such a, a heavy favourite for it that nobody had considered anybody else. So when, when, when Craig got it, everyone was like, who? who? Who is that? And, you know, somebody said, oh, it's the guy from Layer Cake. And I was like, all oh, right, and then you think, oh, hang on, he did that thing where he pretended to be Bond. <laughs> did he know something we didn't, sort of thing? I will always be happy to, you know, see who the next Bond is and go with it. You know, I, I love the Jack Reacher books massively, and when the people said, well, Tom Cruise is going to be Jack Reacher, this is ridiculous because he's only five foot what, and Jack Reacher is six foot five or whatever. And I was like, well, yeah, but let's see it. And I, I think the two Jack Reacher films are magnificent with Tom Cruise in. I think the series is even better, but I, it didn't bother me. Uh, and I think the same happens with, with Bond. You know, let, let the, whoever it is, don't judge them before they've made a film because it's unfair. That's a, a nice segue into my next question, actually, in terms of meeting expectations. So you're talking about actors potentially meeting expectations or not, depending on on who the actor is, but was there any particular Bond film that you were looking forward to maybe more than others? And, and did it meet the expectations that you had for it? I remember when GoldenEye was released and it had been so long since the film before. I, I, I can't remember. Six years it was. Yeah, but for a Bond fan, it was like three millennia. You know, I, I, I really, every year it's like, come on, where are you with this thing? You know, what lawsuit has come out this week that's preventing you from doing it? Does anyone really care? Let's just get this film made. Um, and so when it was coming out, I was... As soon as I heard about the trailer, I remember reading about it in magazines that, you know, they'd started filming and, you know, they were filming here and they were filming there. And I was like, oh, I cannot wait for this to come out. And then it, uh, uh, the British media being the British media, they're saying, well, this is going to be rubbish because he's going to drive a BMW. And this is going to be rubbish because it's got Cracker in it, whereas in Robbie Coltrane. And this is going to be rubbish because, you know, it's got, sharp in it from as in um i'm oh, sorry i'm terrible with actors names um i was like no i really want to see this i'm a bond fan i've not seen a new bond film in over half a decade and i'm and i'm gagging for it i really need this and when i saw it i went and watched it again the next day i can't remember what year it came out i was probably in my late teens early 20s and I remember I had um, one of those Cineworld passes where you can go and watch as many films as you like in a month. And I think I may have seen GoldenEye four times at the cinema because 
I loved it the first time. I enjoyed it the second time. I enjoyed it the third time. And then a friend said, oh, they hadn't seen it. I said, oh, come on, let's go. I'll go and watch it again. Um, and yeah, it, it, because the, you know, like I'd said, the press being the press, they poo pooed it before it even hit the screen, but I loved it. And I was, you know, it's not perfect. And anyone who claims that any Bond film is perfect, or oh, maybe Casino Royale, um, it, it is wrong. I, I loved it. it. It really was a great film. And and it, it wasn't, I'm not going to say GoldenEye is my favourite Bond film in any stretch of the imagination. It's probably one of, what well, it'll be in the top half for sure. But having been starved of Bond for so long and expectations originally very high then very low when i saw it i was i was sold i think i think um pierce did a great job i find it always fascinating doing these episodes with james bond fans because obviously it comes across how passionate you are about the whole franchise and uh, i just think that's brilliant <laughs> well i mean but, but before um uh, i was going to say this at the, at the as, as you opened the podcast is i just wanted to say thank you to you both because by being invited to do this it was like I'd seen Bond was on um, Amazon Prime and I'd say, oh, I've seen them. I've seen them loads of times. And then I thought, do you know what? I'm going to watch Live and Let Die. And I th and I was I watched it. And one of my kids came in and said, you're grinning, Dad. I was like, I'm enjoying myself. This this is I, I, he, they came in just as the boat chase was finishing. And there's the scene where Sheriff J.W. Pepper comes along to arrest him. And and the guy says he's some kind of secret agent. And he's like, on whose side? And and I was smiling because of that bit, because I mean, it, it, it's it's a classic line in, in, a, in a Bond film, especially for a Bond fan. So when when they, my kids came in and he said, Dad, you're, you're grinning. I was like, I had to explain it to him. And he looked at me like I was nuts. But um, yeah, it, it, having watched all of those Roger Moore films within a, a week, I loved it. I loved every minute of it. Even sitting through A View to a Kill, which is my least favourite Moore film, which I think we'll, we'll come to in a bit, I still enjoyed it. And, and I, I went into it thinking, I don't really like this one. I, there's a bit crap here and it's a bit rubbish here but actually do you know what? i enjoyed watching it again you know so it was it was one of those things that watching them as well you pick up things and you think ah this is this is a trope that bond has created that lives throughout all films things like there is when the for your eyes only when the hitman is coming to kill the the couple on the boat and as the plane comes down they play the the sound of a stuka dive bomber with that and it seems like that's now become a movie trope that any plane in a dive makes the noise of a stuka bomber and in goldeneye i'm pretty sure they had that sound effect to the plane falling off the cliff in in the pre credit scene so um yeah things like that they they having it's probably been 10 years since i watched those roger moore films and yeah i was as i'm watching them, i was like that's brilliant that's great that's brilliant and other things i noticed like i, I heard you guys talk about him in an earlier pod about general google and he's a good russian and every other film that you saw back in the 70s, 80s, even in the 90s, the Russians were the baddies. There were no good Russians. They were all bad. But Google seems to be one of these people who he's actually quite a decent chap. He, he, he keeps that, I am still the enemy, but I'm also going to do the right thing. And I'm, you know, I'm not going to do anything horrific like, you know, everyone assumes that the Russians are always going to do back in the you know, in the Cold War era where every Russian was a baddie, uh, he came across as, as, a, as a decent chap. Whether his, his counterpart in reality would be like that, because it was probably Putin. Um, <laughs> it might, you know, it was Google Putin, but just, you know, set off to one side. But it's things like that that you see and you watch all the stunts and you think they did that. You know, they, if they did that today, that would be CGI, but they did that, you know, th things like that. You know, you, that, that you can't beat that. Thank you, Toby, for that. Moving on now, uh, regular listeners of the pod will know that me and Andy, we rank and rate each of the, the Bond films, but also different elements 
of the franchise. So we're going to give our guests opportunities to pick their top five for various elements of the Bond franchise. So Toby, do you want to kick us off and just tell us what are your top five Bond films and why? Like I said earlier, I always find it difficult to rate the Bond films and because some are better for certain things, some are better for other things. You know, like I mentioned, I think that the best performance by a Bond was in Casino Royale, but my favourite Bond film is The Living Daylights. Um, but if you said to me, right, you can only have five Bond films ever to see again, and which ones you watch, you have to order in the order you like them the most, then I would say The Living Daylights is, is number one. Um, it's a well-rounded film. It's got in what I see as a, a realistic plot line. It's got a solid performance by Bond. It's got the gadgets. It's got the car. It's got the the villain. It's got the henchman. Um, you know, it, it's all there. And second would be Live and Let Die. I think I loved watching that boat chase as a kid and watching it again last week hasn't hasn't gone any worse at all it as a as a piece of stunt work and film work if that came out in a film tomorrow nobody would question the, the quality of it it's absolutely brilliant you know and having seen behind the scenes stuff with the stunts on that you think you know that is absolutely amazing but the story as a whole is good i think um more it was his first film he's solid in it and especially for somebody who had who saw more films before he saw Connery films, it's just it's just great. The Spy Who Loved Me arguably would be my number one. And why it isn't, I can't give you a solid answer to, but it's number three on my list here. It's just, I remember watching it as a kid over and over to the point where I actually broke the VHS tape that I'd recorded it on. Um, I'd watched it maybe a hundred times. And even today I can do the script. Literally word for word, I was when I was watching it, my eldest daughter was in the room. She kept asking me to shut up because I knew it word for word. Um, I even there's a bit where Jaws crashes his car into the roof of a, an Italian house, and I can still quote the Italian. <laughs> and I don't speak any Italian, um, but I could tell it to you now. Um, it, you know things like that. The the film from that bit where. He leaves Strongberg's laboratory and gets in his Lotus from that to the very end of the film. It's just relentless. It's nonstop and it's brilliant, brilliant car chase, helicopter chase with some amazing stunts. It's got the Strongberg tanker scene, you know, arguably the unnecessary bit at the end with Strongberg's uh, underwater lair. But yeah, it, it's it's a it's a magnificent film and uh, and it holds up today as well. Casino Royale at number four, which is probably the one I've waxed lyrical the most about talking to you guys. In terms of a Bond performance, it's flawless. I think Daniel Craig is perfect in it. I don't think he puts a foot wrong. I think it's well paced. Um, it's it's good. I know a lot of people say, oh, the casino bit's a bit long and boring, but I think actually it's perfect because having just had the beginning bit and then he has that really intense fight with the uh, African warlords and his henchmen and then sort of returns and then he gets poisoned and then he returns, that, you know, it's 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 sort of five bits rather than one elongated bit uh, and so uh, it, as a film i think it, it's 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 magnificent uh, and i think daniel craig puts in the best bomb performance in that and then um connery does get a look in i think i've barely mentioned his name <laughs> um in the sort of hour or so we've been talking but it's a real classic old spy movie if from russia with love was didn't have James Bond in the title and it was a, a separate film that anybody could have watched and you know the protagonist was called Steve Jones or something a little bit more British maybe um, it would still be considered I think a great film because of that era it was it was just magnificent in terms of the henchman who was as good as or better than Bond the the plot line being something believable it was the you know that the 
the thing that Bond was chasing, you know, we all we all thought, well, it's kind of like a modern day Enigma machine. This thing, it, it all works really well. There's a few things which I'm I think are a bit naff in it, but you know, it was a film made in its time, and so it, it, it's going to be to that level. But it's it's a it's a magnificent film. So Toby, before we let you move on to the next question, what is the Italian then from that film? Brilliant. I don't know if it's understandable the way I say it, but that's what he says. Do you know? Do you know what it means? Uh, the beginning bit is "Oma Amma Mia," which is and and the thing is, I remember watching it once. We and I had an Italian. I did a a student exchange when I was a kid with an Italian lad, and we watched it, and he laughed, and I said, "Well, what does it mean?" He said, well, "It doesn't really mean anything, but it's almost like, you know, oh my goodness, what am I going to do?" And it, it doesn't re- it doesn't have a, a natural translation, but and, and I've looked it up since, and, and it's sort of that's what they said. It, it doesn't really have. A, he's basically like OMG <laughs> um, for for want of a better word. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's uh, I, I can quote the film word for word if needed. Thank you for that, and I'm sure our Italian listeners will appreciate a bit of uh, international flair. But uh, sticking with, they're probably shaking their heads in <laughs> horror. <laughs> Not at all. I mean, they've heard some of my jokes, uh, but uh, but anyway, let's. I, I want to stick with films, if we may. So you mentioned earlier that Roger Moore is your favourite Bond actor, but he, he had seven films, most of any actor. How would you rank those one to seven? The Spy Who Loved Me, because I've already told you that was my third best um, Bond film, and, and the first one of of the Moore situation. Um, you know, it's magnificent, and and, I, and that's without even mentioning the pre credits ski jump which again to this day people look at and they go wow would they do that in real life anymore that's cgi wouldn't they live and let die is my is my second favorite again the chases i love a good chase um and that boat car chase you know when when the 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 two uh louisiana cops show up and they go uh what's that there in the sheriff's car and he goes what are you talking about, buddy? You haven't seen one of them new car boats and this, you know, something along those lines. Um, I got that a little bit wrong, but yeah, he's, um, you know, just that that whole that whole scene. But the the bit in San Monique and um, uh, even even to this day, uh, I, I hadn't realised until I googled it a few weeks ago that San Monique is a is a made up country, but it's been used in a bunch of other films. It's um, it's like Oceanic Airways, which they use in films, but isn't actually or a real airline, but it's in about ten films. Yeah, it, it's it, it's magnificent. Third one, Moonraker. I think that I break the mold when I say Moonraker is one of my top Bond movies because it's a bit naff and people are right in in places it's a bit naff but again it, it, it's got decent villains it's got Jaws it's um it's got the the Venice chase I think that although some of the characters in it aren't brilliant I think that the film is it still stands up today and I think we you know People who watch it, who don't realise the time frame of it, forget that this film came out before the first NASA space shuttle had even launched. People had seen the space shuttle. Uh, they'd seen it in pictures and NASA had put out press releases about it and there'd been, it had been on Tomorrow's World or, or whatever it was, but it hadn't actually flown yet. So... You know what Bond was doing with Moonraker was was it was special then. You know people forget this when they look now and they go, "Well, the space shuttle program has been dead for decades." You know, but back then this was before the space shuttle had even even taken off. So um, yeah, it, it's uh, it, it's still special and I, I still like it. Again, not perfect, but you know just little things like that cable car fight scene. They they still stand up. They're great, um, you know, uh, and and I, and I enjoy it for that. Next, the man with the golden gun. And having listened to your man with the golden gun episode already, I I, I know what score you gave it, and um, I think I should maybe correct you on this. Um, that it's it's better than a five. <laughs> um, I'm not going to say that it should be a ten or anything, but I I think that it works because. Even though Scaramanga 
has multiple opportunities to put Bond in a coffin and vice versa. They are two peas in a pod, just on on different sides. And I, in the film, you know, the man with the gold, Scaramanga sort of mentions that he and Bond are like each other. And, and Bond is quick to sort of say, well, no, 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 we're not. And actually, I'd agree with Scaramanga. I think they are very similar. And I think that, you know, just because Bond thinks he's doing the right thing, uh, in, in his in his mind he is, and for his country he is, you know, Scaramanga and he are, aren't that far apart, not in reality. And I think that today, uh, Scaramanga's, I don't know what he calls it, is his playground or his, um, you know, where he he and Bond, you know, finalised their fight. And people say, oh, well, you know, the, the time frame's wrong. And how did Bond get changed so quickly? And, and I said, well, if you look at Bond, he's wearing black trousers, a white shirt. All he has to do is put the jacket on, put the bow tie on, and the, the, the mannequin's holding a gun. So maybe that's a real working gun, and he's figured that out, you know. So for everyone who goes, oh, well, this is a bit silly, and this is a bit silly, I, I like it. Um, Knick-knack's funny. And, of course, it's got the, um, the corkscrew jump. So... You know, what's not to like. Uh, next is Octopussy. And having watched it recently, and I, and I think I watched it after I gave you this list, it might go higher. I think because it, with the more films, you expect a massive set piece at the end. And Octopussy doesn't really have that. It doesn't, you know, The Spy Who Loved Me, they've got the tanker, you know. In Live and Let Die, they've got the the underground base in San Monique. And Moonraker, they've got the space station. And the man with the golden gun's got, you know, Scaramanga's Island. But Octopus, he, he doesn't have that that grand finish that, 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 you, that I was used to with the other Bond films. So, yeah, I think that's what had always previously let it down. But having watched it recently, I, I, I enjoyed it quite a lot. You know, even with the silliness, you know, when he points at the tiger and says, sit, you know, that they, although they're silly, I think if, you know, Daniel Craig had done it, we'd have all gone, yeah, all right, Daniel, thanks for that. You can, don't be a Bond again. But with Roger, it works because that's who he was and that's that's the Bond we got to know with Roger. So, you know, all those things that, you know, people who are watching it now sort of dislike about it, I think are things that actually they're all right and they are who the actors were. And again, like I said, they're of their time. Uh, what's next on my list? Uh, for Your Eyes Only. Never been the biggest fan of this. I remember being a lot younger watching it for the first time and seeing the red lotus explode i i nearly i think i did actually cry you know how could this happen you know now bond has to get chased in a in a 2cv um but you know watching it again recently i was like actually it's it's fun you know and it, it changes the dynamic and it and it goes to show that you know bond isn't reliant on his gadgets he's a magnificent you know, superstar in, in 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 this sort of world of, of of spies and what have you. Anyway, just because he has this car, it just makes his life easier. But he can still achieve what he wants to achieve, even when he doesn't have these gadgets. And my least favourite, which I think I've already mentioned, uh, a view to a kill. I think Bond does look too old in this film. I know the bits in For Your Eyes Only where the um, the very young looking ice skater girl is, is, you know, trying to kiss him and what have you. And, and thank goodness that the, uh, the writers would chose to go down the correct route with that one, uh, uh, and have him turn her down. But, um, in a view to a kill, it, there are bits where you see him jogging and even then you think, oh, I think you are a bit long in the tooth for this Roger, but I think he does all right. I think the biggest problem for me is actually the, the villains in it. They're almost, caricatures there uh, i i just I, I think zorin's a bit bit naff and a bit silly and mayday is is just unbelievable uh, uh, as a as a, a villain and, and the bond girl is very very weak you know she's she has nothing about her really um so yeah all in all i don't think a, a view to a kill was, was was very good and that there's not even any real scenes from a view to a kill that that jump out and I think yeah that's a really really good scene that one there's nothing that jumps out you think that was maybe one more film too many yeah i think it was and and i i 
I don't know if you've read it, but uh, Roger Moore put a book out called uh, My Word is My Bond about 10 years ago. Uh, and in it, he he says that it's one of the only, one of the very few regrets he has in life was um, one was allowing somebody, I think it was the, in, in, a, in a TV episode of Ivanhoe, making him wear a hat because he hated wearing hats. And the other was um, making a view to a kill. So <laughs> of the regrets he had, they were they were sort of very far apart. And uh, yeah, even he, he thinks that it was one too many. Moving on, Toby, we've obviously talked about your favourite Bond films and the favourite Roger Moore films. What are your top five Bond girls? For me, the, the Bond girls have always been sort of like a, a means to an end. And I think, the, the strongest ones are the ones that are sort of like on a top and octopusy ones who, you know, look like that they have the ability to look after themselves. But in terms of, you know, the ones that I enjoy their performances and, and, and having them on screen that I think the list I've given you again, Pam Bouvier from License to Kill, um, because I like the fact that the assumption is, is that she's a bit of a, you know, bit of a naff agent who's sort of not very really strong but actually turns out to be you know critical to bond being able to complete his mission and and, and sort of helps him out a lot i think the andrea anders character who we've talked about already the next one is not just for a, a comedy effect but um i always loved the scene with uh chu me in uh the man with the golden gun and i think as an adult it, it it has more of a bearing than when I watched it when I was a kid, thinking it was funny. Um, and, and as an adult, sort of seeing the double meaning and that sort of thing. So, yeah, Pussy Galore, I think, was... Um, I think she set the standard for what Bond girls should be because the first two Bond girls were sort of very different and they were more passive. And uh, she actually... You know, those, those two roles, the, the film could have existed without them. Whereas with the Pussy Galore character, she was pivotal in, in the whole process. How, how Bond got her to, to change her ways, I think, wouldn't stand up in cinema today. But yeah, I think uh, as a character. Uh, uh, and lastly, Anya Amasafa, also known as Triple X. I think it was about time that, because at that point there hadn't been since Pussy Galore such a strong character who was a female character and you know triple x was for she was bond just for the russian side and the, the gender thing didn't really make a difference until the very last scene had triple x not been female had been male character it would have worked just as well um but for the because of the nature of the name of the film it it, it needed to be needed to be so yeah, thank you for that. So, moving on to Bond villains, I suspect we know what number one and two will be based on our earlier conversation, but how would you rank top five Bond villains or henchmen? Well, like I said, Jaws and, and Kaufman, they're my top two. I think the third one I've, I've gone with is Nash from, uh, from Rush With Love. I think that he had the ability and the skills and the, the, the about him to, to better Bond. Bond had to outsmart him. Uh, in the end, because in a physical one to one, it was it was always going to go Nash's way. But I think, yeah, he was, uh, and I th and I liked his character because it was it was overplayed in terms of him pretending to be this English gent who knew and uh, and that sort of thing. And but Bond was able to see through that. Next would be Alec Trevelyan, double O six, having an, another double O being the villain was was a genius move because who who could be as good as bond than you know somebody else who's as well trained and equipped and, and knowledgeable as, as as bond himself and you know even to the very very end of that film although we all know that bond is going to win because he's bond you know the uh, 006, you know, he had Bond's number and he, he could have he could have won that very easily. And number five is Scaramanga, or the man with the golden gun. Again, he is somebody that was a real threat to Bond. He was somebody who, had he used his smarts a bit better, would have beaten Bond and beaten him easily. You've got to have a villain or a henchman who is Bond's better or equal. And looking at the list there, 
we have a bunch of henchmen. I don't know if Alec Trevelyan counts as a bit of both, because uh, on the top was probably the, the henchman in, in, in that one. But uh, yeah, they're all hench people. <laughs> they're all um, they're all psychics. Um, and th there's one thing that uh, I have to admit to today, and that is that until this week, and I listened to your podcast, I thought that the other villain from the beginning of The Spy Who Loved Me was called Chandlor, not Sandor. And it was only listening to your podcast. I was like, who's this Sandor bloke they're talking about? And I did a quick Google. And I was like, for 40 years... I've been getting this man's name wrong for 40 years. How did this happen? But yeah, and he, he, he was one of these ones that when I was watching the films, I was like, do you realise that Roger Moore's Bond has probably got the strongest chin of any of the actors? I swear he takes more punches to the face than any of the others <laughs> uh, combined because, you know, he really seems to take a massive battering. Never gets a bruise or a, a, a gash or anything. Um, but yeah, that, that fight scene on the roof with Sandor, not Chandler, he, uh, he takes a fair few whacks to the face in that one but yeah sandor is not on, on on my list of henchmen but yeah that, that that's my my henchman list well, thank you for that and it's it's good to know that we can educate as well as entertain here on the rating room that's so it's a nice indeed <laughs> that's uh something to go on the on the advert for future episodes that we are or maybe we'll we'll move this to the education section of uh of spotify or or whatever thanks toby for you know talking through your, your top five bond villains so we you've obviously mentioned before that Roger Moore is your favourite Bond actor. What are your rankings for the Bond actors? So yeah, Moore, Moore's my favourite because that's what I grew up with. Craig is number two. He's the one that, I like I've said, he gives the best performances. Brosnan, third. Again, loved his films because they were of my time. Dalton would be higher, I think, because he had two films, one of which was my favourite, the other of which is probably my third least favorite and so the poor guy was stuck with two films at each end of my spectrum and I, I, I really wish he'd had the opportunity to do one or two more because he definitely had the potential to be a, a really good bond and he had that sort of don't careness about what he thought about doing. he just wanted to get the job done didn't matter what happened to get there Connery I uh, have no problem with Connery movies but they're before my time and I like them but the others are just a bit better there's there's nothing inherently wrong with the Connery films I, I enjoy them but the others I enjoy more and Lazenby I think he had a really good stab at it and again like with Dalton wish we could have seen more of him and, and it, it's incredible how in the last 15 years his portrayal of bond has been everybody said he's the worst bond ever 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 and on a majesty's secret service is rubbish 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 that was what it, everyone said 20 years ago 15 20 years ago when you ask people now very different um you know everyone waxes lyrical and says it's a great performance it's a great film but yeah i think the only reason he's bottom because he only got one film not his fault i think that's uh, that's fair enough you can only work with what you're given i suppose and um when when we talked about Lazenby in a previous episode, I think we said the same thing. It'd have been nice to see what what it would have looked like had he been given the opportunity to do more. One final question though before I let you go, and it's probably not the best one to finish on because you mentioned earlier you're not necessarily a big fan of the music. But do you think you could rank a top five of Bond themes? I will run through them because, like I said, I, I'm no big fan of of the Bond songs. I've already mentioned "You Know My Name" by Chris Cornell, "Live and Let Die" number two, which I think is always people's favorite or next best favorite the living daylights by aha it's um you know it's a good song and even though you sometimes feel like with these songs they've had to shoehorn the name of the title in there somewhere i think that this one is a is a bond film name that works well as a song lyric and a song title as well so yeah uh, it is a song that I, I won't turn off if I hear it. So there's the song from The Man with the Golden Gun is not at number four. And with, with the caveat that it's how they play it at the end of the film rather than how they play it at the beginning of the film. And it's only because how they tie it in with the last words of the script where M is trying to get hold of Bond and he's saying, Bond, Bond. And 
Bond doesn't answer. So he's going, good night, good night. And then Bond goes, good night, sir, and hangs up. And then the song goes, good night, good night. And and how they link the two together. So that, that's why that I, I like that one, because I don't mind listening to it at the end, but I'd, I'd fast forward it if I was watching it earlier on. And lastly, I, I couldn't even tell you which my fifth or favourite one is, because, like I said, I'm not a big fan. They're all much of a muchness. I, I'm, th- apart from the first Craig one, I couldn't even tell you what the other ones were i know i think billy eilish did one and but you know i i have no affiliation to them at all yeah that's what the fast forward button was originally made for i was <laughs> i stand by this well it's we're not going to fast forward this episode that's for sure it's been fascinating listening to your views so thank you for being a guest um and that's the end of this episode uh, check out more specials coming soon with more bond super fans but in the meantime feel free to head over to the main pod to catch up on our latest episode or go back through the archives for the older episodes that we've done. And thank you once again for participating and thank you for listening to us here on The Rating Room. Well, that's this week's episode done. We hope you enjoyed it. Special thanks to the band Sugar Tongue for the theme tune to The Rating Room. You can find them on all the usual social media channels and be sure to check out their song The System, available now on Spotify. You can find and message us on Twitter, Facebook, TikTok and Instagram by searching The Rating Room. You'll find all our social media links on our website, theratingroom.com, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Or feel free to drop us an email at theratingroom at gmail.com. Goodbye, thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week, right here on The Rating Room. Thank you.